I'm going to begin with a quote by Borges, and I'll do it in English rather than in Spanish, because I presume there are more English speakers than Spanish speakers. And it goes the following. He cites um, Novalis to begin with, and he says, this is Borges, the greatest sorcerer would be he who bewitches himself to the extent that he takes his own phantasmagorias for autonomous entities. Is that not our case? And then Borges answers Novalis's question. I conjecture that it is. We, the indivisible divinity that operates within us. We have dreamt the world. We have dreamt it resistant, mysterious, firm in time and ubiquitous in space. But we have consented within its architecture tenuous and eternal interstices of unreason, so that we may know that it is false. Now that little expression, interstices de sin razón, interstices of, son, of unreason, I've seen it translated as chinks of unreason, and I've seen it translated as cracks of unreason, but I like, I like Borges' word, interstices, interstices of unreason. Now, I've been long fascinated with interstices of re unreason since I think I was a very young child. Um, in fact, my whole life seems to operate with these bizarre interstices of unreason. And I've spent many years exploring interstices of unreason through a variety of different ways, one of which was an exploration into the meaning of the word mysticism. And that took me down some weird and wonderful places, and I'd I recommend it as an exercise. Try and find out what mysticism means. You really do enter chapel perilous indeed. Um, and uh, it, yes, it, the, 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 research, the research or the investigation, the explorations into the word mysticism led me down some extraordinary places. And in the same way, my research into my investigations into the word imaginal, which is the word that I'll be exploring now, have taken me down some similarly interesting places into the world of fairy and elves into the world of Robert Anton Wilson's conspiracy theories, where you just don't know what's real and what's not real, into the world of fairy stories, into the world of visions, into the world of poetry and fiction, obviously into the world of Jorge Luis Borges. For those of you familiar with Borges, his entire world constantly play, like, like Robert Anton Wilson, constantly tripping you up. What's real, what's not real? What's fact, what's fiction? Extraordinary. And just as my research into the meaning of the word mysticism took me into those earnest, eminent thinkers, especially if they were Victorian and bearded, who have researched and have investigated the word mysticism, such as William James or Evelyn Underhill, or moving forward to Zayner and Stace and Huxley, and all the way forward to the present day, so has my investigation, my exploration into the word imaginal led me into those fewer people but no less earnest and eminent, who have likewise investigated and used the word imaginal. Now, it tends to begin with Myers. Um, and although when I first encountered the word imaginal, it was through Henri Corbin, not Corbin, Corbin, um, um, it goes further back, it goes back to Myers. Now, I'm just going to talk a little bit about Myers, because I find him an extraordinary person. I haven't got my head around him at all. And in fact, I've been talking about Myers to a, with a variety of different people today already. Frederick Myers was a poet, a classicist, a philologist, um, and one of the founders of the Society for Psychical Research in the end of the 19th century. Um, and like so many of his day, there are peculiar parallels of interest. Interest in um, the newly emerging language of evolution, and taxonomical schema for the living world. Um, at the same time, fascination with weird stuff, seances, mediumship, ESP, telepathy, etc., etc. And at the same time, something which is I'm, I, I can't speak about with any authority because I haven't really understood it yet, but this proto-eugenics that we find with Huxley's grandfather, T.E. Huxley, and we find in some of the um, the, these explorers into, into evolution in the 19th century. So Myers bridges all these strange fields. And um, Myers, in particular, was a collector 
and a collector such as we later see with Charles Fort, we see to a certain degree with Colin Wilson, a collector of stories of the weird, stories of the anomalous. And we owe to Myers many of these words that we now use quite regularly, words such as subliminal, such as subconscious. Um, in fact, his work, um, The Human Personality and Its Survival of Bodily Death, was very influential in the development of psychology, not least with William James, with whom he was friends, and in fact, William James and Myers, they both pledged to each other that whoever die, would die first would then come back and talk to the other. And Myers died first and did go back and talk to William James. And in fact, throughout the 20th century, lots of people have had um, conversations in the medium world with Myers, just like many people have with Alistair Crowley as well. Anyway, he develops this word imaginal. Now, it's really in it's intriguing to me where he, you, from, from where he used the word, and I've been reading the, the correspondence between T.E. Huxley and um, Myers, and this is the word imaginal. Now, for those of you who don't know, because I didn't know until relatively recently, the imaginal cells are the cells that, un that stay constant through the process of metamorphosis of a grub into a butterfly or into a moth. And these are the cells that, in the, in, during the caterpillar phase, they do nothing, okay? They just hang in there. Not very many, either. All the caterpillar cells, they're all busy doing their, their stuff, their digestion, their uh, respiration, their cell tissue, um, that, sorry, their, 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 the structure, their whatever function they're playing. But these imaginal cells, as they're called, imaginal discs, as I found in Huxley, Huxley grandfather, <coughs> all this, um, these are the cells that hang in there. And during the process of metamorphosis, they then grow and develop and they become, they, they, they come together and form the imago, the perfect insect, which is the insect that then becomes at the point of, en of exiting the chrysalis. So the imaginal cells, from that biological perspective, um, they have a very specific meaning. Now, what Myers did, and as far as I understand, he was the first person to do so, Myers took that expression and applied it to the position of human evolution. And this is very strange. Now, what he did is he made a leap, although he was retaining the scientific language. His interest in odd phenomena, he saw as being these matters are related to our potential. What we have a glimpse of in the same way that the caterpillars munching their way through a leaf one of them might see a butterfly and go, holy crap, I can be one of those, right? So Myers developed the idea that the that, that humans, their strange powers, their strange talents, as uh, Colin Wilson would call them, these talents were indicative of our greater potential. I won't say any more about Myers because I find him an extraordinarily curious character and I haven't fully understood him, as I said earlier. If I move on to Henri Corbin, we find, of course, that uh, Myers' uh, work was very influential on Jung. And for those of you familiar with Jung, Jung's a, 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 a man who comes up so often in these sorts of um, discussions. And Jung's development of active imagination is purely based upon the imaginal. But I'll leave Jung out for a minute and move on to Henri Corbin. Henri Corbin was professor of um, Islamic studies. Um, at the École de, de, des Altitudes in Paris. But in particular, he was a scholar of two interesting men. One was Emanuel Swedenborg, and uh, I've spent a long time researching Emanuel Swedenborg, and I've written a couple of books about Swedenborg. Swedenborg is something I pay, I've paid a lot of interest to. And also was an Andalusian um, Sufi mystic um, by the name of Ibn Arabi. And what um, Henri Corbin discovered in Ibn Arabi was this capacity for theophany, this capacity within the works of Ibn Arabi, which Ibn Arabi called Alam al-Mital. And Alam al-Mital, Henri Corbin struggled to try and translate and he until he came up with translating it into his neologism, which is Mundus Imaginalis. Now, the Mundus Imaginalis, I will cite my dear friend Angela, Angela Voss, um, in her wonderful essay, I recommend it to you all, A, method, a Methodology for the Imagination. Brilliant, make a note. Um, a lovely essay written about 10 years ago by Angela Voss. And Angela writes in her essay about um, Corbin. Corbin uses the term mundus imaginalis to designate the psychic space 
in which the super-sensible reality of dreams, theophanies, and spiritual beings are manifested in a visionary sense to the individual. This is the intermediate place in the Neoplatonic cosmos of em emanation from spirit to matter, where the former is given a perceptible form through an image, and the latter loses the density of embodiment and is seen through to its immaterial essence. This is the place revealed through the symbolic image and perceived by the corresponding soul activity of the active imagination. There we have it again. An approach which has been developed by Jung and James Hillman through the disciplines of depth and archetypal psychology. Um, so what we're talking about is we're talking about an intermediate space. And I find this, again, very interesting. It's not the world of material, mundane, day-to-day -day existence, but neither is it the world of the gods. It's the intermediate world where the gods and us mere mortals come into some form of communication. And of course, this is through all these many processes that we will be exploring over this entire weekend. All the different methods of altering one's state of consciousness, which is altering one's state of perception, which is altering one's relationship with reality. Now, this, as Angela indicates, moved on with Jung, and Jung was a good friend of um, Henri Corbin. They, 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 they met regularly at the uh, Iranos Institute, um, at the gatherings at Iranos, and Jung developed this precisely as an, as, a, as an approach to create those spaces, to create those numinous encounters in order to develop his work as depth psychology. And uh, I'll leave that aside because it's, it's a huge area to go into on another occasion. And similarly with James Hillman. Now, I find great, great accommodation within James Hillman. James Hillman is an amazing man. Um, for me, he resonates, much, he resonates with me much more so than Corbin. For Corbin, it's all a bit solemn and a bit severe and a bit... The encounters are with these luminous beings of great, great import. Whereas Hillman talks about the the messiness of soul-filled existence, the quirks and the anomalies, the strange moments, those twists and turns in our development. Those are the moments that I find particularly interesting. And Hillman's whole work of archetypal psychology is developed behind this principle of the soul and of the heart. Absolutely wonderful. To me, much more, um, much more meaningful than Corbin. And so it goes on. So various people have, have encountered this term imaginal. So the question is, if we're using the word imaginal as this intermediate space, why do we have this word? Why not use any of the other many words that we have, such as mystical, such as numinous? Or on the other hand, why don't we use the word which is a fair, fair, fair use of the term, which is the imaginary or the imagination? Why this particular term? Well, I've long asked myself this question. You know, what is this particular term imaginal? Well, I feel that there is a threshold to cross. So on the one hand, we could say the imaginal is the active power of the imagination. That's lovely, the active power of the imagination. Think about the whole history of human development. In fact, Danny Nemu, for those of you who know him, he's explored this in his works on neuroapocalypse, which is the, the flashes of insight, those moments of brilliance, the, the astonishing power of the imagination, and how Society, human society, civilization, our whole development as a species has been predicated upon these moments of insight and illumination. Now that, yes, is the creative power of the imagination, but, it, but there's something that leaves me sort of, there's something else there. There's something that needs to be said. And I thought about the threshold because I thought, of course, we can leave the imaginal in the imagination exclusively in the same way that we can talk about divination. Now, let's just, uh, I'll just explain this as an illustration. For those of you familiar with, you, with, with reading the I Ching, or for those of you familiar with looking at the major arcana of the tarot, or any other divinatory moment, a divinatory act, it's inevitable that it's going to be meaningful. Of course it's going to be meaningful. Let's take the I Ching, 64 hexagrams that have had many generations of wise people adding their responses right the way down to Carl Jung and the uh, translator... Um, Richard Wilhelm. Now, inevitably, you are going to prepare yourself for an, a reading, for a divinatory reading. You are going to slow yourself down, meditate on your question, and you are going to consult through a process of chance, whether it's the coins or whether it's actually following the Yarrow Stalk principle, 
you're going to consult a book of wisdom. With all this procedure followed, it is totally inevitable that you are going to have a very meaningful reading of that hexagram and the judgments and the changing lines and everything associated. In the same way that you're going to have a very meaningful relationship with one of the cards of the Major Arcana, should you reveal it. So here is the Hermit, here is the Papess, here is the Imperatrice, here is whoever it might be, La Luna, Le Soleil. Inevitably it's going to be meaningful because these are meaningful cards. But that's not crossing the threshold, you see, into the imaginal. You see, for those of you who are familiar with it, and probably not everyone, there are these bizarre times when the card winks back. Yeah? There are these bizarre moments when it transcends the mere following of a set of procedures that inevitably lead to a meaningful act. Something else happens. Some strange occurrence, some strange sense that the book is somehow, in the case of the I Ching or the cards, are somehow responding to you. And in my case, where it's been most meaningful, probably even more and more meaningful than in divination, is through literature. I teach the works of Borges. I also teach the works of Julio Cortázar. Or sometimes in English it's called Cortázar, with a C. Amazing, amazing author. Similarly, Juan Rulfo, Mexican writer. And what I found with these authors is that there are fictions are set up which involve a character who finds himself actually dreamt by the author and engages in dialogue with the author and then the author gets involved in the fiction. This is like in, the, in Don Quixote. A wonderful set of riddles are set up. Borges does this all the time. But of course that isn't really the imaginal. That's the description of the imaginal. Where it becomes imaginal is when you, you find yourself hauled into the drama. When you find yourself acting out an act of this particular drama itself, of the plot, you find yourself drawn into the fiction. To the degree, I can see some various hard heads nodding, that's encouraging, I like this. Okay, so you're familiar with this. It's a peculiar little flavor that, it, that happens only very rarely, but when it does, that to me is the crossing of the threshold. So, in my work into mysticism, I dealt with all these earnest people who have tried to define and categorize and explain mysticism. And, I th and somebody actually asked me, okay, William, what's your definition of mysticism? And I thought, okay, here's the best I can come up with. Mysticism is mysterious. That's it, <laughs> right? And in the same way, I've been compelled both by myself and others. Okay, I even I named one of my books imaginal landscapes. And of course, people say, hold on, is that a spelling mistake? Didn't you mean to say imaginary or something else? No. So what does imaginal mean? Give me a definition. And I thought, okay, my first definition was weird shit happens. <laughs> but then I thought, no, that's not it. That's not it. Because you, for example, could have huge bookshelves filled with Forteana, with the works of Charles Fort and the attendant bizarre phenomena. So you can, go, you, can, you can pass a certain threshold by saying, yes, I accept that weird shit happens. But for me, the imaginal is when you understand that the weird shit happens to you. <laughs> Aha! Right? That it's not something that's only compiled in works by Charles Fort. It's something that can happen to you. And this, to me, was a great breakthrough in my reading of Borges. Um, he describes an event that happened to him in 1926 when he was 27 years old. Um, of walking in the outskirts of Buenos Aires, and he suddenly fell through time, and he ended this sort of crazy timeless zone. And, uh, and he writes about it. He wrote about it in three different places. Um, it, it made such an impact on him. And he calls it sentirse en muerte, feeling in death. Now, for me, what was particularly powerful about his text there is his understanding, not that mystical experiences are possible because he knew they were possible because he had read Emanuel Swedenborg, Jacob Burma, um, Santa Teresa de Avila. He'd read all these mystics. So he was perfectly okay with the possibility of mystical experiences occurring. For me, what seemed to be the real flavor of sentirse en muerte was that Borges realized, ha, it's happened to me. So, the imaginal. Back to try and find, how long have I been speaking? About 20 minutes? Think so sorry, I'm chairing, so I'm kind of lost a little bit in my own. I'm falling out of time. Okay, um, I'll, I'll wrap up. So, what? How do I? How do I try and define 
the imaginal. And the way I do so, I appreciate is quite trickster. And it can unsettle people. And sometimes people get really upset with me, especially my two young daughters. Right? And that is, how to answer the question, is it dream or is it waking? Is it real or is it fantasy? Is it fact or is it fiction? Is it inner or is it outer? And what's the answer to those questions? Yes. Right? Is it inner or outer? Uh-huh. Yeah? Is it fact or fiction? Yes. Yeah? Now, the thing is, that's a pretty tough thing to hold on to. We're not trained along that way. We're not trained. We are trained back to Aristotle. We're trained in this very Aristotelian logical circuitry where it is either A or B. It is black or white. You are either my friend or my foe. What religion are you? What nation are you? What race are you? What gender are you? What this and that and the other? Give me a firm category. It completely rots with our system and our, our general educational pattern to say that something can be both and neither and one and the other all at the same time. So why do I think this is important? Well, I think that upsetting this dominant ideology is really necessary. Think about the type of ideology that dominates our lives. What dominates our lives are these categorizations about every aspect of reality. Where are you going to situate it? Is it there or is it there? And the answer that it can be both here and there, it's an act of flexibility. It's an act of both ontological flexibility. So my, my work two years ago here when I was talking about the DMT elves, you know, are they real or are they made up? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Are they, are they, are they uh, autonomous in their own existence, or am I generating them? Yes. Right? That's my basic position, and, it, and I know it upsets some people. But I feel that this is a way that will help us understand the reality of our experiences without, having, without getting hung up on these ontological questions, without getting prevented from going through the doorway, because we're too worried about what the nature of the doorway itself is. So. If I had to conclude anything, I'm going to conclude with a quote by James Hillman, because I think the man is lovely. I recommend James Hillman to everyone. He died a few years ago. And he writes about entering your own fiction, which is in a way similar to Robert Anton Wilson's don't get duped by anybody else's BS. That's both um, belief system and bullshit. But most of all, don't get duped by your own BS, you know. This is... Bob Anton Wilson, for those of you who are familiar with his works. Um, Hillman, James Hillman and Healing Fiction, a book called Healing Fiction, which is a lovely, lovely book. Entering one's interior story takes courage, similar to starting a novel. We have to engage with persons whose autonomy may radically alter, even dominate our thoughts and feelings, neither ordering these persons nor yielding to them full sway. Fictional and factual, they and we are drawn together like threads into a mythos, a plot until death do us part. It is a rare courage that submits to this middle region of psychic reality. Notice that, middle region of psychic reality, where the supposed surety of fact and illusion of fiction exchange their clothes. And so if I were to conclude with one expression, I would say, what is the imaginal? It is re-enchantment. There you are. Muchas gracias. <laughs>